What up, my homies? Look who, look who I got here. And, I, and I'm making him get something out for me. Stay tuned. We're going to talk about fall winter fishing and like one really cool bait that he knows <laughs> a bunch about. Check this thing out. So, everybody, JT Kenny. Make sure to um, check him out. JT Kenny, he's on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. He's all over the place, dude. Throw him okay. a like and subscribe. I'm literally all over yeah. the place. <laughs> Trust me, I'm all, all over the place. All Oh, and we've been a little all over the place today. Gunnersville is kind of an interesting place right now. But what's really cool that's happening is it's going to be freezing. Like a lot of this grass that you see is going to go goodbye. And we're going to get into the best time of the year fishing out here. And that's that, that pre-spawn period or winter period that lasts all through like December, January, February. And then we kick into the spawn. But that's when, like last year, I think there was like a 13 and a half, or two 13 and a half caught during that. But one thing I don't know about a lot are these. I haven't thrown a spinnerbait since fishing like Chad spawn on Lake Okeechobee or even fishing up north. But this guy, you know, he's really cool with freaking nickels. You guys check out the Paul Setter, and that's what we're gonna talk about. I want some spinnerbait recommendations and how to fish them as we're going into this pre-spawn period. Cause I don't want to be throwing an A-rig all the time. You know what I mean, dude? Like what what dude, do you recommend in how to fish? A spinnerbait is a mini A-rig. And that's what I was thinking. It kind of is. Right. And my arm today knows that's what yeah. A real A-rig feels like. So I got two different kinds, and let me, me my my spinnerbait stuff's a little awry right now. Believe it or not, even though shad do not have chartreuse in them naturally, and there's probably somebody out there right now going to go, dude, 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 bro, dude, dude, bro, I saw a shad. That, okay, yeah, maybe you did. That's fine. Cool, dude, bro, yourself all over the place. Awesome. Um, but for some reason, chartreuse and white is really good and then i really like i really really like this one from nichols it's uh i'm just terrible that i don't know this but i think it's like violet sh violet shad i think but that one with just a little bit of purple in it and it's kind of like a more clear skirt you know where that's like a white skirt this one's it's it's not perfectly clear but just that little bit of purple and that little bit of purple on those blades i'm sure in the sun you can see that little bit of yeah, purple on those blades it. That's really good, but this one is still not the exact one I'm looking for. So this I one. really, really like on the chartreuse and white, a silver blade and a gold blade. Really? For, for all kinds of water? For all kinds of water and all kinds of conditions. The funny joke I kind of make about that is they always say use silver blades when it's sunny, gold blades when it's cloudy. Well, more often than not, it's partly cloudy. So, but seriously, yeah. I, I have just had just years and years of experience putting a silver blade and a gold blade on it is just really seems to work and another thing i like to do too is is sometimes i'll put an extra little weight oh that's like one of those rubber core sinkers and i pull the rubber core out and just crimp it you know with a pair of pliers just crimp it on the shank of the hook and then what that'll do is that'll give you that small profile of a half ounce size but it'll give you the weight of a three quarter so you can actually make that bait move a little faster. In real clear water, like you can see here on Gunnersville today, you, know, you can see down four or five feet. You, you gotta make a spinner bait move to really get bit when it's that clear. Now they'll bite it and they'll bite it good, but it's gotta be moving. And the only way to do that is to still have that small profile bait because so many of the big baits, um, obviously I got a mess going on here, but like here's a three quarter or a one ounce of that color that I really like, the purple one. It's actually mating with a smaller one at the moment, <laughs> and I messed up a family moment there. But see how much bigger profile that bait is than that bait? Well, but that they, weigh the, they weigh the same, That bait though, is right? than that bait. Yes, but when you put on the smaller bait, will weigh as much as this one when you put the weight on the shank of the hook. So that smaller profile allows you to move that bait a lot faster, and you'll get just way more bites. Huh. All right, so on that, let, let's do like two more things then. So we're, we're going into like fall, winter. What what are you, what, or give me some recommendations because I, I mean, you know a lot more about this lake than I do. What are you throwing it on? What kind of weight? And I noticed you got a lot of double double willow spinnerbaits oh, yeah. in there. Is yeah. that pretty much what you're always throwing? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the only time that I'll go with, with Colorado's or, or uh, 
Will, or Colorado's or Indiana's is when either the water gets really, really cold, and I'm talking about cold, cold, like 52 or below. It gets down, then you wanna slow it down a little bit. Um, and the other thing, what you're looking for, once we get past here in Northern Alabama, just for instance, once you get past about the middle of November, most of the grass is gone. Say the end of, end of November, first of December, most of the big grass beds are gone. But the key from then until probably March is if you can find what little grass is left, if you can find some that's still green and still producing oxygen and still nice and crisp, where most of it will be all brown and dead, that's what you really want to key on. Because that's where the bait will be. And your spinner bait's going to look like bait. And the bass is going to munch it. And you're going to have fun. It's going to pull. And you're going to pull harder. And then it's going to pull harder. And then you're going to pull even harder. And then you're going to hold him up and take a picture. That's exactly what I want to happen. That, that is perfect. Uh, a couple more questions, as long as I got you, because you're a wealth of information. Do you ever put a, a trailer hook on those jokers? Yeah, if they're if they're fish are swiping at it a lot and not getting it, I absolutely put a trailer hook on it. I've even put in open water situations like fishing for smallmouth. I've even put a uh, treble hook trailer on it before. Yeah, that I've actually tried yeah. that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, but I I never start with it. Never start. Because I, I honestly believe, and everybody kind of thinks I'm crazy. Well, I actually am, but everybody thinks I'm crazy. But if the fish are biting a spinnerbait good, I think a trailer hook screws it up. Really? If they're really inhaling it good, I swear I feel like I lose some of them. And the ones that really do get it good, the trailer hook rips their gills and I'm hurting the fish. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because we, we, me and JT talk a lot about fish like management and fish care, especially fishing in Florida when it gets really hot. You really have to take care of fish. You guys probably saw some deep water videos where we really tried to like take care of the fish, get them back, catch them, picture, fun, smile, back in the water. Let me hit you up with another question. And this is just something like your experience, Dale. But like, you know, chatterbait's a huge bait out here. And it catches oh, giants. absolutely. Have you experienced literally where you put down a chatterbait and pick up a spinnerbait and catch them? Or is it usually one or the other? Or what's your experience with that? Because they're both bladed kind of water displacement they are. baits. But they, they are. And there's just sometimes when they don't want that hard vibration of the chatterbait. But I'll tell you another time, I'll use a spinnerbait and a chatterbait. I really like that Freedom chatterbait from uh, Z-Man. But I'll use that one um, like in conjunction with a spinnerbait. Like if I have an area, just like I was talking about earlier, where I've found you know, a little acre or so out here on this flat that the grass is still green, I'll go through it all with a spinner bait or the chatter bait and then vice versa. And just give them something different to look at. Right. You know, if I'm just working around in like a one or one and a half acre area, you know, I might want to switch back up, you know, switch bait so I'm not showing them the same thing constantly all the time. And even you might even, you know, uh, throw in a, a lipless crankbait in the mix there too you know they're all kind of if they're feeding on chad you know that's another bait that that they'll bite it's not quite as weedless as a spinnerbait or a chatterbait but uh you know depending on the depth and everything you know you, you can throw that in there too but just but just going back and forth between baits if you're staying in one small area now if you're just going down a long grass line you know all the way down a mile you know you try to figure out which one they're biting better whether it's chatterbait or spinnerbait and then stick with that right but when you're going through you know you're staying in one little area one little pocket or whatever yeah i would definitely switch between the two so last thing i i know back in i think it was like the early 2000s like i got a lot of guys were throwing like that big nickel spinner bait that you mm -hmm. showed me but they were putting giant trailers on it like they would put like big grubs or mm -hmm. like big swim baits and stuff do you it seems to me personally i'll just be 100 percent honest. it seems kind of gaudy and stupid to me like because you want them to get the bait and you're just sort of stopping the fish from getting to the hook you know they're going to eat right. it it's reaction bite but what's your opinion on putting a plastic trailer on the spinnerbait to make it a little more appealing well for one i don't know about putting a great big one on there like that but you can really change the depth of a spinnerbait by, by several different things but by adding a trailer is one a nice thin like most of the time i don't even use a trailer but sometimes i do like if the water's you know, like we've been dealing with clear water here all day, but if the water's a little stained or even muddy, you want that's when you go to Colorado or Indiana Blades, which will make the bait ride higher in the water column or be able to be reeled much slower. If you add a trailer to it, that'll make it ride even higher in the water column and or let it reel much slower. So you can really change, and you can even change by the size of the blades. Like if you put, say, a number seven and a number five willow blade, on a bait, it'll make it ride much higher in the water column. And then put a trailer on it, 
you know, it's just more bulk and it'll make it ride even higher. And you can then, if you like in stained water, you want to reel it real slow, you know, or cold water, you want to reel it real slow. That's when you start adding trailers. It's, it's for the optimum thing that you want is say, this is the bottom, this is the top. Say just for instance, the grass is halfway up. So say it's six feet, the grass is three feet off the bottom. You don't want your bait running up here. You want your bait running right along the top of the grass. So you can tweak that bait to where you can get the retrieve speed that you want. Like I said, if it's super cold water or muddy water, you want a real slow retrieve. The warmer and clearer the water, the faster the retrieve you want. But you can change your blades and change your trailer to make that bait run right you know, efficiently right along the top of the grass. Like I said, you want it as close to the grass, or if you're just fishing like a hard bottom, you want that bait to run as close along the hard bottom as it can without hitting the bottom a whole lot and without getting, if it's in grass, going over the top of grass, without getting down in the grass, and then you're jerking it and snatching it and you're inefficient. You wanna make it run right through there. So that's how you can do that, by changing either the configuration of your blades, the size of your blades, or by running a trailer or not, and how big and bulky the trailer really is. That clarifies a whole bunch because I think I'm going to be throwing a spinnerbait quite a bit this year. You know, it's a good alternative. Everybody throws a chatterbait around here. I know guys throw spinnerbaits, but you wonder sometimes if there's different like waves, you know, like guys are always throwing a chatterbait. So you get out something a little more old school, you know, like the spinnerbait, show them something different. And they're just fun to fish. They're super versatile, dude, super weedless, almost more weedless than a chatterbait in some in some situations. But I, th I think in eelgrass, they are more. I think they are too. And there's been a lot of that on this lake. This oh, there's year, a ton man. of eelgrass. Yeah, now. dude. Bro, I appreciate it. It. JT is good people, dude. Make sure to um, throw him a subscribe. He has some awesome videos on YouTube right now and follow him on Instagram and that. But I appreciate the tips. I'm going to implement them. Guys, if you enjoy this kinds of videos and freaking hanging out with JT from time to time, make sure to hit that like and subscribe on this video. And we are out. We're going to go try to catch a few more fish before the sun goes down. Peace.